Let me ask you something. Have you thought about it yet? And I mean really thought about it. Maybe you have thought about it, but quickly get it out of your head because it's scary. Or maybe you say you're okay with it because you believe it's going to be peaceful. Why is that? Why is death scary? Why do we seem to run away from the thought of it, even though it's going to happen to us? It's because of what's on the other side. Whether you believe in something after death or not, whatever it is, you and I are going to have to face it forever. If I could just have a bit of your time today to give you my thoughts, I would appreciate it. We both know death is coming for us, and it's coming quickly. The way I see it, we're rolling a dice every day. We've rolled for life so far, but sooner than later we're going to roll the skull. Why is it that thoughts of what comes after death seems to invade our minds? It's because we were made like that, and God has put eternity into the human heart. Maybe this makes you uncomfortable. I'm sure some of you have had existential dread when thinking about this stuff. I'm only 22, but if there's one thing I can tell you, is that those thoughts are crucial and are needed. You guys already know that I believe in God, and deep down, I think almost all of us know he's really there. Pushing the thoughts of him away isn't going to help, guys. I've tried that for years. I thought that I had to be successful, fix myself up, and then I can take God seriously someday. I'm very glad God put eternity into my heart before that. Have you guys bought into the lie? The lie that we just simply can't know what's going to happen after death, so let's just do whatever we want before that time comes up? That's not true. We can understand what's going to happen. Think about this. We're intelligent humans. We have a sense of love, a sense of right and wrong, a sense of justice. We believe in fairness. If we have things like that, I think it follows that God, or whatever higher power you believe, must have known how to create that within us. If our creator knows how to give us a sense of love and of fairness, he would have to know a whole lot about love, and a whole lot about fairness. We also know that this being would have to be really, really intelligent to not only make a complex being like us, but also the entire universe itself. Solar systems, black holes, galaxies, gravity, nebulas. So guys, whoever made us is very intelligent and has a sense of love, fairness, justice, and more. His sense of justice is probably going to be a lot more sophisticated than ours. His sense of what's good and evil is definitely stronger than ours. What we think is just simple little mistakes, he probably takes a whole lot more seriously than us. I'm trying to make a point here. I hope the logic's been following smoothly for you all. My point is that we have a maker who really cares about right and wrong, and if he really is fair and just, then that means he's going to have to do something about us after we die. So may I ask you, are you ready for that? No. None of us are ready. Not if we took a break from our day and really thought about it. When we see a criminal in the courtroom, someone who did something nasty, and they get a large punishment for what they've done, we're satisfied. We know justice has been served. We just established that God has a sense of justice, far more than all of us. Again, we're dealing with a being who knows how to create a sense of justice in us and has enough intelligence to create a whole universe. So let's think about what we've done. How many times have we lied in our lives? More than that, how many times have we justified our lying, calling them fibs, half-truths, white lies? How many hearts have we broken? How many times have we snapped at people? How many times have we taken revenge? How many times have we stolen before? If you've ripped an avatar in VR chat, or taken an avatar without paying the author's Patreon, you know what I'm talking about. It's not easy to look at ourselves like that. I know. Knowing that we've done wrong to others? It's not easy. I'm not doing this for no reason. There's something I'm trying to get you guys to understand with this line of thinking. God is just and we have to face him after death. If we faced him today, would any of us be innocent? Not if he's truly just. Think about it. If you and I saw someone in court, and they're let off the hook because the judge didn't care about the crime, we know that true justice hasn't been served. Think about the strictest judge any human can be on earth. All speeding tickets must be paid. All sentences must be served. That's final. Period. God is much more than that because his standard is far above ours. So yeah, you and I might try and say we're good people. And by our own human standards, yeah, we can think we're good people. But who are we really to God? To put it bluntly, we're criminals. 
I'm not intending to hurt your feelings, by the way, though I'm sure it's inevitable with the topics in this video. I'm trying to get us to think seriously about things that are worth being serious for, right now. Sure, we can think that our bad deeds are just small mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes after all, so who can we blame? Is that really going to slide with God, though? If we're judged by his standards, we're all guilty. So that leaves you and I with this question. Heaven or hell? I've asked many people that, and many try and dodge the answer by saying that it's his call. We really can't know. While I agree, yes, it is his call, that doesn't mean we can't know what he's going to do with us. Maybe I should just take it directly from his word. Maybe that will help us understand. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful desires, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. The reason that I'm being very critical with this, you guys, is so that we're all left without excuse. I know that with the thought of death, we all have our way of coping with it. One of the ways that's most popular to deal with it is to simply push this thought out, or doubt that it's really going to happen. Trust me, I've done it plenty of times, and I know it doesn't work. When have excuses really solved the problems of life, though? So, let's face this like adults. Let's be grown up about this. If we don't cope with it by pushing it off, maybe some of us cope by giving ourselves false hope, built on our own lies. The mistake many people make is thinking that their good deeds will outweigh their bad ones in the end. I certainly think we all feel like this. On our good days, we think we'll go to heaven, and on our bad, not so much. Imagine, once again, a man faces the judge on his trial. He pleads with the judge, admitting that he's guilty, but he's donated to the poor hundreds of times, so he should let him go. We'd probably all raise our eyebrows at what the man just said. In reply, the judge would say that his good deeds have nothing to do with his crimes. That's not how justice works. He's being judged for the bad he's done, not for the good. If our good judges don't let crime slide even though the people who done them are good people, how much more will God see justice served on all of us even when we think we're good people? Let's take a step back, now that we've rid ourselves of the common excuses. We have a sense of love. Very much so. If God knows how to make our sense of love, and he's far more intelligent than us, he must have a deeper sense of love than us. That explains why he cares so much about us in the first place, even though we're small. If God loves us, yet he's going to punish us for what we've done, then how can he even prove his love to us? Well, I would think that if he really wanted to show his love, he would do something about our upcoming punishment. He would want us to be free from our sentence. But there's a problem. Because even if God loves us and wants us to be set free, he still has to see justice done. Otherwise, he'd be corrupt. A truly fair judge won't let evil slip by even if he loves the guilty party. So we have this collision between God's utter desire to see us live with him forever, but also his deep sense of justice that wants to punish us eternally. How does he reconcile the two? Well, if he really wanted us to be free, and yet our price has to be paid, he himself would have to do it. He would have to be our representatives first, which means he'd have to take human form. He would be both human and divine, both man and God in one. He would have to live a perfect, sinless life, otherwise he'd have to pay his own price. Only a man who is God would be able to do that. Only a man who is God would be able to live a perfect life like that. He would then have to volunteer to take the punishment we deserve, death. But if he actually did that, then we could be freed from our case. He can love us and still see justice served. The price can be paid. So the question is, did he do that? Has there ever been a person who lived a perfect life and yet died for the crimes he never did? I'm sure you can put the pieces together by now. This is that guy that we're talking about in Sunday school, Jesus Christ. People don't really believe him. And I think the main reason is because people don't really understand why he died in the first place. He died for our sins, they say. But what does that have anything to do with us in 2023? As a young adult speaking to other young adults right now, I'm going to say this. If you can get a full grip of what that man did for you, it will change your life. There's a reason I've been a Christian for a year now. I've dumped a lot of info on you guys today. 
So, let's break it down into bite-sized pieces, something we can take into action. What I've just covered is that since we have a sense of love and justice, our Creator has to know how to make that in us, which means He also has to have a sense of love and justice of His own. Since He's the Creator of the universe, He must have been pretty darn smart which means his standard of love and justice must be very much higher than ours. He sees our evil deeds, all of them, even our own wicked thoughts. There is nothing hidden that won't be revealed on the day of justice. So we have to come to terms on where we're heading, heaven or hell. If we take away the excuses that deceive us, we eventually come to the truth. It's scary. Terrifying. God is also loving though, and true love would make a way out a way to eternal life. To satisfy his justice and yet set us free, God had to live as our representative, as a human, to take our sins upon himself. When he took our sins to the grave, God raised Jesus from the dead, proving to all of us that he's truly God and truly man. The Father gave Christ authority over the whole universe, and Jesus gives eternal life to whoever he pleases. This means one thing for you and I today. We are at the complete mercy of Jesus Christ. He has the final say over our lives, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Thankfully, he is rich in mercy. He has endless life at his fingertips, and he can hear you right now. He knows what you've gone through. He gets it. He was beaten, betrayed, accused, and executed after all. I think if there's someone who knows suffering, he certainly is the one. Your depression, anxiety, fears, doubts, bitterness, self-hatred, despair, stress. He understands. He knew everything about you before he made this world. So the most important question for your life is this. Will you trust in him? He's not looking for you to get your life together before coming to him. He doesn't expect you to understand everything. He doesn't expect you to be courageous right now. He simply wants you to trust in him. Faith is trust. When Jesus saved me, he had me learn early on what faith actually means. I know it's a word thrown around in church jargon, so it's kind of lost its meaning. Faith is trust. And it's not a blind faith. It's not believing without evidence. If you really want to know if Jesus rose from the dead, I'll link videos that can help give you certainty about that. It's down below. What's most important right now, though, is your trust in him. He can reveal himself to you, but first you gotta trust that he can. I'm not just saying this, by the way. The only reason I know this to be true is that I've experienced exactly that. I became desperate for Jesus. I needed to get to know him for myself. When I had that desperation that pushed away all the other worries of life to the side, he revealed himself to me, and oh boy did he reveal himself. He transformed me, and has been continually doing so to this day. I had to be hungry for him first, though, so I pass this choice on to you. If I could go back in time and tell myself the best advice I could, I'd tell him what I'm about to say to you right now. That fear of death you have? It's okay. Don't be afraid to get serious about it. There's a scary conclusion to it, yeah, but there's also an answer. Jesus said it himself. I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And yeah, you can choose to cope with death through all these various lies that we've covered, but why choose the blissful lie when you can have the real truth about reality? Just take all this confusion that you have, all of these burdens you have, all this stress, and put it on him. He'll take your burdens from you. Just simply trust in him. Get to know who he really is for yourself. Get to know what he has to say about himself. If you're willing to take that step, then make it known to him. He hears you right now. He knows you're suffering. He understands you. I will warn you though, this is not going to be easy. Jesus doesn't just want 50% of you, not 80%, not even 99. Jesus wants 100% of you. He has your best interest in mind, and he knows all things. That's why trusting in him is so important. You're not alone in this, by the way. I've had many questions like you guys have. Maybe back in church, nobody could answer them for you. There are answers, though. I'm willing to help. I'll give my Discord down below so you can ask me questions there. My prayer goes out to you guys now. I thank you, Father, for giving us life for another day. We are at your mercy, and you're rich in mercy. You have taken such good care of us. You've given us what we need. 
I thank you, Lord, for sustaining us. I ask you to give us knowledge about you, that we could just have a sliver, just a fraction of the knowledge of Christ. Just being able to know Jesus is worth more than all the money in the world, all the friendships, worth more than past and future, life and death. Jesus, I ask you to give these people a relationship with you. Give us a hunger for you, even if we don't have any right now. Give us a desire for you. Please open our eyes to understand how much you have loved us. Help us in our times of need. Transform us by the power of your word. Give us a hunger for your word and a desire to speak to you. Give us today the soul-satisfying, spirit-nourishing, life-giving knowledge of who you are, Jesus. The real you. I ask this in your name. The name above all names. The almighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you around.